Hey folks, welcome to OutDrive. I'm Cliff Callis, and I'm here to bring you actionable marketing insights you can apply to reach, connect with, and convert rural American consumers. Join me in the front seat as we head out on the road to success. Let's go. You know, I certainly found that within the company, there were no boundaries to the size, type, industry, or, or scope of the account. So as long as we had the relationship capital, which would be you know business development, us finding where the opportunity was, we could pair that up with intellectual capital somewhere within the company to provide you know great solutions for our clients. The firm's kind of taken the firm stance that you need to become verticalized if you're going to be successful in this industry, which is something I think in the last 10 to 20 years we've started to see in the insurance space because those relationships that clients have with generalists just aren't, I don't want to say not cutting it anymore, but the, the market is really looking for an expert in, in what they specialize in. Persistence and grit, they play a major role in business. We're opening ourselves up to rejection on a daily basis and leaving the door open for new challenges that come along with capitalizing on new opportunities. Having that to persevere to successful outcomes for our clients and, and service teams and ourselves is, is all important. Hey folks, we've got another great story to share with you today on OutDrive about life and work in rural America. I've known today's guest for his entire life, as his parents and I have been friends for many years. Even from a young age, Brendan Hurley has always been a go-getter, and now in his career, he continues to aim high. After graduating from the University of Missouri with a bachelor's in mass communications, Brendan found his stride in the world of commercial insurance here in Missouri. Brendan is in his sixth year as a consultant at Assured Partners, specializing in employee benefits and retirement for commercial clients. He also has a niche for architecture and engineering clients. Along with several years of sales experience, Brendan has a genuine passion to help people find the best solutions for their business and employees. Welcome to OutDrive, Brendan. Well, hey, Cliff. Thanks for having me on. Been looking forward to visiting with you. Uh, we've known each other a long time, but for our audience who might be meeting you for the first time, talk a little bit about your background growing up. Well, uh, Cliff, so I'm obviously from Sedalia. Many of those who, who are close to me know that, that I was adopted. I was actually born in Bolivar, Missouri. My parents, Dan and Jenny Hurley, who I know you're, you're friends with, sought out uh, adoption uh, after they had a kind of a difficult time uh, be becoming pregnant. And so the funny story of, of my origin, I guess, starts there. And uh, soon, soon enough, after, after they brought me home a couple of weeks afterwards, they, they found out that they were pregnant with twins. So <laughs> I'm sure it was a shock for a little while. But so I have, you know, I grew up here in Sedalia and, and I have uh, a younger brother and sister who are only seven, seven months younger than I am. And, and we've all, uh, you know, once I was adopted and brought home from Bolivar, I, I, we've just We've, we've lived here ever since. So you went away to college, went to Mizzou, um, got your degree and, uh, you know, young man right out of college could have gone anywhere, chose to stay in the area. Why? Well, it, just like a lot of opportunities, I feel like, uh, insurance was, was not necessarily my calling on the outright, but I came back to Sedalia and by coincidence, uh, the, the, I work for Sure Partners, and uh, our former agency owner Rick Thompson. He caught me, you know, after a round of golf to inquire about, you know, what I was doing after school and what I was looking at, and it was just a casual conversation after I think we'd played, you know, nine hole round with my with my dad, and caught him at the turn, and he he said, "Well, had you ever thought about insurance or financial services?" And of course, I said, "Well, not not really, not more than just touching the surface of it." Um, at that time, I was looking at a few few opportunities that would take me out of the state. Um, this was, yeah, just like I said, just right at, I think, probably the summer before my senior year. And anyway, he said, well, why don't you come over to my office and, and we'll talk about it. And, and he kind of left it at that. And I think maybe a week later, I took him up on it and uh, I came by and he, he had me go through an aptitude test, told me about the industry. And then he said, Brendan, my, my firm or my agency were actually getting ready to be 
be acquired by Assured Partners, and I think there would be a great opportunity for you to uh, join us. I think it will be an exciting time to, to take this on. You know, I'm going to be transitioning out of the business, and there's just going to be, it's just going to look a little bit different. And anyway, after all of that and a couple of more interviews, I kind of decided after weighing the option of moving back versus moving away in the insurance industry, after learning more about it, 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 it excited me. And so I, I decided to come back and it really came together like that. So moving, you know, obviously moving back home to be closer to my parents was, was a, was a big determinant and being close to family, but I knew I'd find my, my place and I knew there was opportunity in, in Sedalia. So, yeah, there's lots of opportunities here. And of course, insurance is, way more than just insurance. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about some of the different products and services that you provide and that maybe you specialize in. I know you, you're living in Columbia. We're recording this before your wedding date, but it will air after your wedding date, which mm. I think is just an, an interesting coincidence. But, uh, you know, when I think about Columbia, I think, you know, really great small city in the Midwest. And when we think about what rural America is, Columbia fits right into rural America. Oh yeah. You've got the university and you've got tremendous healthcare and a great commercial marketplace, lots of nice residential, but in the big scheme of things, it sets in the middle of thousands of acres of America's heartland. And, and so, you know, you got a nice city that sets sort of in a country setting as a whole, what do you like about living in, in Columbia in, in central Missouri? Well, I think I'll just take a step back to what you first said. You know, I'm getting married in November. And so we had actually, we were supposed to get married last year. But my fiance, that brings me up to my fiance. She is from a small town as well called Jasper, Indiana. That's a, actually a smaller town than, uh, than Sedalia. Even I think they may only have 15 to 17,000. Still a nice size town. But so we're both from you know, rural, rural America, in fact, the Midwest. So we have deep roots and, in, and in, in rural America, we've always wanted to come back to, to be closer to family and, and appreciate living in it. We both knew there was opportunity coming back to a rural area. In fact, our hometown. So I think to get back to your question, I mean, we realize that there's still opportunity, like you said earlier, in any, any small town, I, I believe that you find opportunity where you're planted. It's not so that uh, so much that you have to go to the big city to find that. I think a lot of my classmates right now, uh, or excuse me, my you know, former classmates and colleagues that 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 was a big deal, right? You wanted to find you wanted to find a job in the, in the big city out of college, and that was what was going to take you. And and so I think I took a little bit different approach, and I'm really glad I did. Um, Sedalia has had a lot. A lot of great things to offer me, and and I don't know if I'm veering too far away from the question, but you know it, it was kind of a no-brainer for us to. And again, I live in Columbia, but but I do a lot of work. I come into Sedalia pretty much every day, and and you know that's just that's where we decided to plant our roots. I know that you're working a bigger bigger marketplace than just Columbia and just Sedalia. No, I appreciate your perspective because I think the key word and everything that you said there from from my perspective is opportunity. And there are so many opportunities in rural America that people don't really realize until they start to take a look. And, uh, you know, uh, known you most of your life, all your life. Uh, I think it's great that you would see that opportunity and, and, uh, marry a nice young lady who also has the same viewpoint and want to end up living back here. I think it's great. And, you know, as I think about how you got into the role that you're in now, Rick Thompson has been a friend of mine for a long time. And when he makes a statement, you know, Brendan, I think this might be an exciting time to be in this business. It's kind of like the old Merrill Lynch, you know, you listen to that and obviously you acted on it. And I think that's great. So what was it about it specifically that really attracted you to it? Well, I was, you know, I was certainly, Rick was a big driver, right? It, everything in life, I've, I've started to find that relationships matter. And when, as you said, when he was guiding me toward this path, I knew just knowing Rick for so long, I, I knew he wouldn't lead me astray. And I knew what he had, I didn't know what he had built, uh, but I knew what kind of guy he was. And, and as I started to learn more about his business and this business in general, I knew it was an attractive opportunity. To me, it was, what attracted me the most was, 
to get to take a shot at a growing business without the initial investment administration and everything that goes along with what might have been owning my own shop, which at that time I wasn't really thinking of. But now that I'm in it, it hindsight's 2020. So being a producer consultant at Assured Partners has really allowed me to pick a lane and, and run with it. And, and what I mean by that is we're able to select a vertical or specialty within, you know, whether it be property and casualty, employee benefits, retirement, and have all the resources and mentorship at my disposal to become successful from day one. Obviously, everyone needs insurance. And the fact that this was an industry where, you know, you're able to build reoccurring revenue and grow, that, that was also a huge driver. Uh, you know, a lot of the sales positions and consultant positions you'd look at coming out of college were, they may have had a base salary, but it was all new business, new business all the time. And so this was, this was a, an avenue that, aside from the industry itself, I could see myself really building something and, and assured partners that they really impressed me during the interview process by introducing me to some produ other producers in rural areas who were, you know, only a handful of years into the business, but already carving out successful careers. You know, I certainly found that within the company, there were no boundaries to the size type industry or, or scope of the account. So as long as we had the relationship capital, which would be, you know, business development, us finding where the opportunity was, we could pair that up with intellectual capital somewhere within the company to provide, you know, great solutions for our clients. Yeah. It's kind of a win-win, isn't it? I'd, I'd say so. Yeah. You know, as I think about some of the uh, folks that I know who are in the insurance industry, it would appear to me that they have a lot of freedom. I mean, I see them on the golf course, not that I'm out there as much as they are, that must be a misnomer because my golf game has gone to hell in a handbasket. Going in, I thought, well, heck, we'd, I'd get to play golf all the time. But I think that that might be more of a misnomer than a fact of the industry. No, I'm sure that's right. But I think there is a certain amount of freedom that comes with your role, right? Oh, I mean, I certainly, I certainly think so. I think at the end of the day, management doesn't really care about the steps you take to get there. If, you know, if we're driving success for our clients, um, and promoting our value to new opportunities. But, you know, that that's kind of a loaded question. I enjoy the team I work with. I'm excited about the culture we're building. And I truly enjoy the verticals of expertise I've chosen to pursue. But that that that's the that's the freedom that I feel like it is we can decide as producers what we're going to chase after, what we're going to spend our time trying to learn. Uh, you know, I mean, within insurance, there's there's property and casualty, which is anywhere from commercial, personal, and then sub niches within that. So going after agribusiness, energy, aerospace, architects and engineers, you know, every sub set has, has kind of specialists within the insurance industry. And so uh, our firm's kind of taken the stance that you need to become verticalized if you're going to be successful in this industry, which is something I think in the last 10 to 20, 20 years, we've started to see in the insurance space because those those relationships clients have with generalists just aren't, I don't want to say not cutting it anymore, but the market is really looking for an expert in, in what they specialize in. Well, you're right on target there. I mean, I know in our business, um, you know, we have specialized insurance just for the advertising industry. And, you know, you and I have talked about this before, you know, when, when we get a policy, you know, it's it's not impossible to set and read the whole policy but it's sure not the most fun thing that you spend your time on. And so in that regard, you really need to trust your, your agent and your broker to make sure that they're asking the right questions and they're looking out for you. And you have that element of trust where we know that, Hey, you're, you're doing the best thing for us. And we're trusting you to do that by providing the policy. So, yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, we're seeing that in our own business, you know, our, our kind of specialty is marketing to rural America because it's a different place uh, than any other place that I've ever been. And the more you specialize, the more you know, and the more valuable you are to your, to your clients. I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't agree more. So tell us a little bit about your specialty. I know you've kind of, uh, I know you probably started out more general, trying different things, learning, and, and now you're kind of focusing in a certain area. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So I think, I've got, like many producers, you're, you hit the nail on the head. I started off as, as a generalist, just trying to get my feet wet in insurance, employee benefits, you know, so the whole gamut. But as you come along, you start to find your niche. It doesn't always just come right away. Um, so 
the areas of practice that I really spend the most time are, are corporate retirements. So those would be your defined contribution plans, like your 401ks, your 403bs and, and 457s and non-qualified plans, medical plans. So helping employers really with their entire employee benefits package. So medical insurance, dental, vision, short-term disability, long-term disability, all of that. On the employee benefits side, uh, that, that's where I spend a lot of my time. And then it, just by happenstance, I have kind of a sub niche that, that is in architecture and engineering professional liability. I think we had talked about that before and how that's, that's a market all on, on its own that, that requires expertise. And so those two to three areas are where I spend most of my time in business development and, and looking for opportunities. But it's certainly not to say that, uh, you know, we don't look outside of those, but those are where, where we have a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of opportunities and a lot of expertise at our disposal, not just here in Sedalia, but, you know, across the company. So what drove you down the road of the architects, engineers, and designers? What took you there? Well, it, it, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Like I said, I started off as a generalist, but the, the people that I, my, my family, you know, we're, we're a, I guess, third generation here in Sedalia, I, I would be. And so my family used to own an electrical contracting business. And so they, when they would go out to do jobs, whether it be commercial jobs, usually commercial jobs, they would have to work with what we call MEP engineers. So mechanical, electrical, plumbing engineers. And so, you know, we had some, some relationships, some contacts that, that were left over from, from when my family owned and, and ran Queen City Electric here in Sedalia that, that I could reach out to and, and kind of establish a relationship with. I have, you just had some friends straight out of, out of college that were, um, you know, either owned their own engineering company or, or had an, owned their own architecture company or were part of one of those. But what really drove me was that we just owned an insurance insurance company uh, here in the United States, Assured Partners did, that that specialized in that. So I was able to get on a track with them, learn from some really great mentors about, you know, the different markets, what you have to look for, and some of those things that helped, helped me drive success for my clients. I don't know if that, that makes sense, but. It does. And, you know, once you get started and you like it and you're maybe good at it, and you start learning more about it again, you become more and more valuable as you gain more expertise and experience. And so you're able to help your customers find the best products and services that work for them that they need. Yep. So knowing you as I do believe that you're probably very good at what you do. What does it take to be good at what you do? Gosh, that's a loaded question. I mean, what does it take to be good at insurance sales in our position? I would say so persistence and grit. I come into work every day with the idea that I'm going to be faced with rejection. Any individual in business development, including yourself, probably Cliff, you might agree with me to a certain degree on that, but uh, persistence and grit, they play a major role in business. I, I mean, we're opening ourselves up to rejection on a daily basis and leaving the door open for new challenges that come along with capitalizing on new opportunities. So having that to persevere to successful outcomes for our clients and, and service teams and ourselves is, is all important. I feel like those individuals who might not do well in the face of rejection can either retrain their brain to cope with it or, or be better suited in finding a different role within the process. But uh, persistence and grit is certainly important. I would say the ability to listen and ask the right questions. You know, it's like we always say in this business, you don't just go out after clients and tell them you want to quote their business. We need to learn more about their process and what their pains are just in any sales role, listening and really asking the right questions is going to help us get to the right outcomes that we need to produce for our clients. I think maybe lastly, time management. All of these are probably things that are important in any business, but these are what I've come to find. Time management, its it's got to be high up there. Being protective, if not even selfish about one's time is all important to allowing us to spend the time in high production activities that we need to. I think the persistence, the ability to ask the right questions, time management, the other things will come. I'm speaking, I'll be six years into this in September. So I definitely have expertise in the fields that, that I'm going after. But when I first started out, that's all I had, persistence, <laughs> luckily a little bit of time management, and I learned to, to listen and ask the right questions. So I, I think if you can do that, you can be successful in this business. The expertise will come, right? You know, uh, we have the resources, at least here at Assured Partners, where if we've got somebody that we're bringing on new, we could kind of say, well, go out and drum something up for us, you know, 
if you're going after a, a wind farm account, well, I can tell you right now, I, I don't know anything about the insurance or risk transfer on ensuring the development of that, but we have folks that know everything about that. So that's just maybe one example. So going back to what I said earlier, pairing up the relationship capital with intellectual capital to help draw new business opportunities across the line. Yeah, well, I, I, I like your approach and I, I think you run on target with what it takes to be successful. I've always thought over the years, you know, as I've talked to, to Rick uh, and others in the insurance business that your business and our business are very similar, particularly on the business to business side. I mean, we're selling services to business customers as you are. And I think the ability to listen and not just ask questions, but in your words, ask the right questions and good questions is really important. And, you know, we talk sometimes about selling versus marketing. And of course, they're, they're interrelated. They work closely together and marketing helps sales become better. But, you know, with selling, the, the concept is, well, I've got this product to sell and I'm going to go try to sell it to everybody. But marketing is trying to identify those people who need your product and then they sell themselves. And so I really liked that the idea of asking the right questions because you're probably not a good fit for everybody, just like we're not a good fit for everybody, but you ask the right questions and you determine that. I think I say that every time I meet a new prospect is, you know, I, I don't know that we're the right fit for each other, but, but let's talk and and find that out. And a lot of times if we're met with the, you know, Hey, I, I think I'm really in a great spot. This is, this is the best thing, you know, for me, you know, I say, well, that, that may very well be in the three different outcomes that could come out of this would be, Hey, we either both decide you're in the best spot right now. Uh, we, we can either tell you something that could improve your program or you, that that customer or prospect will realize, wow, I'm really in a suboptimal position. <laughs> and so then that's when we can really engage after we've asked the right questions to get them thinking about things that are outside of the realm of what they consider the best program they've ever had. Yeah. And so and not to interrupt, but that, that you're hitting that on the head. Well, and I think the other part of that is that um, maybe you're not right for us today, but a year from now or two years from now, things change. You know, people change, processes change, technology, everything changes, right? So, you know, I think the from the initial conversation, I know in our business to a sale sometimes takes several years because they may not need us today and they may not need us tomorrow. But, you know, one of the things that I've tried to do in my career is just stay in touch, just be connected, maintain those relationships. And here's my phrase of the year, which everybody around here is getting tired of, I think, is because you never know. You never know when you never know. (laughs) Be on deck. Be on deck. That's right. Be ready to bat. Well, you, you talked a little bit about assured partners and you, and you talked about Rick Thompson and uh, IBG insurance and benefits group. Many people may not realize that they are one and the same. So talk a little bit about maybe the history of that and how they came together and what it means today. Yeah, so I guess I just give just a brief brief snapshot of of kind of where where we came from. As I know it, I haven't always been here, but I so I hope if Rick or some of the former owners listen to this, they'll they'll probably correct me on the trajectory of some of the history here. But uh, IBG, of course, stands for Insurance and Benefits Group. Um, but we started, you know, depending on how you look at it, whether it was First Insurance Agency or Magern Matea Agency, uh, there was a merger between those two to create Magern Matea Tom- Thompson Agency, which was here in Sedalia. Um, and then we merged years later with uh, Randy Russell Agency and Kerber Kendrick Agency to create IBG. So that was Insurance Benefits Group. So Magern Matea Thompson was here in Sedalia. Randy Russell Agency was there in Warrensburg. And Kerber Kendrick was in Knob Noster and later reopened a- an office in Lee Summit. And so the history of that, I want to say maybe, oh gosh, Insurance Benefits Group was maybe formed in 2001, 2002, somewhere in there. And then the Magern Matea Thompson was formed in, in the early, gosh, 90s. And so 
assured partners came around in, insurance and benefits group was was of course there and running since since the early 2000s but we were acquired by assured partners in 2015 so we're we're going through a rebrand right now um i would guess you know i don't think legal's on the line here but i would say that uh, next year we would officially be you know known as assured partners we already have the awning up on our building but so a just to give you a little insight on ap Assured Partners was formed in 2011 after a few executives from a few large insurance brokerage firms decided to partner up with private equity to start bringing some of the best privately held insurance brokerage firms across the nation together. So hence our, our slogan that's it, it, our slogan is power through partnership, which which aligns really well with what we're trying to do. We went from being an insurance shop at IBG that was just under 10 million in revenue per year to being part of an organization with you know, 300 plus offices, 6,000 plus associates, and nearly, I think at this point, more than 1.6 billion in revenue. So we're the, we're the 10th largest brokerage firm in the United States. But, you know, it still feels like, a, in some regards, a mom and pop agency. You know, we're still such a decentralized company that we have these resources at our disposal, but um, we're still here in Sedalia, Missouri. We're still serving the same clients we have. You know, we're expanding our horizons into to areas where you know, maybe we had we had looked at expanding before, but didn't necessarily have the resources to capitalize on. That's kind of our trajectory in a, in a nutshell, all the way from from our early origins. Well, I think what you're offering is really the best of all worlds. You have all the resources in the world um, to provide to clients, and yet you're still local. You're still a, an individual, a person that that uh, your customers can get to know. And you maintain that sense of community, I think, in a way that you operate on a local basis. So really, I think you're offering the best of all worlds to, to your customers. Yeah. And well, I mean, and even for us on, on the team member side, there, there's, there's uh, recently they've, they've allowed for stock options. So there's still the ability for us to be, you know, quote unquote, locally owned. Uh, they, they allow, you know, some high performers and different, different folks across the agency to, to become a shareholder. So that that's exciting for us. I know that's exciting for a lot of my colleagues that are that are part of the company and and that that we offer that. I don't know if it differentiates us. I don't know what other firms are doing, but it's certainly something that's exciting. Well, there's uh, coming from somebody that works for themselves that gives you the opportunity to sort of work for yourself and yet have all these resources in your back pocket. So, you know, our focus in our podcast is marketing, right? Marketing to rural America. Talk a little bit about the way that you market your services or maybe market yourself. You know, Cliff, we're always trying to evolve our understanding of what our prospective client needs. So to more accurately address your question, we market our services by a well-defined consultative analysis. So by doing so, we're able to get in the door, get in front of company stakeholders for an in-depth conversation that guides our team to solutions that they may need. So after spending some time with a, you know, a prospect early on, we can, we can tell usually if there's an opportunity to work together. Um, you know, for example, this is an easy one. Uh, after engaging with a prospective client recently to uncover that their HR staff spends an egregious amount of time collecting enrollment forms and manually entering elections for open enrollment for their employee benefits health insurance, through consultation, we recommended that, that they're doing too much manual labor. So we analyzed their, their program and and, and a couple of different online benefit administration platforms uh, to come to a solution that, that met that pain point. So that's just kind of one small example that, you know, through, through a consultative analysis, we, you know, by asking the right questions, by figuring out where the pain is, we go to market and figure out what the solutions are. It's not simply that we'll take, uh, take information and go, go quote the market, go beat up the market to see if there's a better deal. But if we can create time administratively back for, for their stakeholders, for their HR teams, for their admin teams, for whoever, you know, we've won and, and they've won. And it goes back to what you were saying earlier. It's a win, it's a win-win situation. Yeah. So if I understand what you just said, you know what you're good at and you look around for other potential clients uh, that fit into that, those markets or those industries and then you approach them with the opportunity to kind of analyze and assess what they're doing and how they're doing it, and then provide solutions that make it better. So how do you get your foot in the door? How, this is my curveball question for you. 
Mm. You know, it's one thing to identify them. It's another thing to be able to talk to them. How do you, how do you do that? Well, Cliff, you know, there's, there's no one answer in that. I think you have to be multi multifaceted in your approach to prospecting. If that's, I guess what, what you're asking for. So we know who we're wanting to go after, you know, each producer is tasked, you know, including myself with creating, you know, creating that list, creating the list of, of individuals that we, we feel by looking at them from an outside in perspective, we, we think there's, you know, opportunity to engage them and, and create a more optimal solution for them. So, you know, whether it be, I still say to this day that the best way to reach clients is just to pick up the phone. I think there's, there's a lot of uh, information out there. You, you know, it, we're, we're not really in the mass marketing space. You, you know, mm -hmm. uh, we are very targeted in who we're trying to reach after. So the phone, email, email's good, but but really picking up the phone and getting getting straight to shareholders is the best way for us to to get in front of someone. Now, obviously, we'll mix that in with with stopping in and and trying to trying trying to you know catch catch a prospective client in person. But uh, anymore, there's so much technology available and prospecting tools out there that allow us to find contact information like there's a for instance you know a, a, a platform that we use that i'm sure a lot of sales organizations use called zoom info and later after this podcast you're going to have to hit up zoom info for a, for an endorsement to help pay for this broadcasting uh, but uh, they, they're, they're going to have an ad on here in a little bit oh good good well they i don't know if you're familiar with them but you know they they're essentially a data aggregator and so if i if i decide that hey i want to meet uh, cliff callus and so I'll look up your, your information on Google and, and it'll show your office line, but it won't really, it, it won't tell me what your direct line is. It won't generally won't have your email. So we use different tools to find out how to reach stakeholders more efficiently, right? So if we're, if we're doing tons of reach out, we want to be as efficient as possible. And so tools like Zoom Info help us get to the decision maker or have a direct line that's, that's available for us to, to call readily available. So, you know, that with a mix of other, other, uh, a whole bag of, of, of diff different ways to get in front of people like joining associations that, that may be a part of the industry or niche that we're going after to try to meet, you know, not maybe not even clients, but just other, you know, whether it be accounting firms, uh, law firms, you know, other, other entities that may have uh, a similar similar niche that 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 helps us just create those relationships necessary to get in front of the right people. Well, and yeah, you I think you made a great point there. You know, those uh, industry associations, community organizations, um, getting your name out there, getting the brand awareness that you need, so that when people think about the things that you offer, they've already heard of you. Of course, that also sort of uh, warms up a cold call. Oh, I've heard of you or, or, uh, yeah, I met you at the event. All those kinds of things can kind of play into that prospecting process. And I know you are involved in a variety of community organizations or you have been over the years. And I know not all of that is just business driven because I know what kind of guy you are, but what attracts you to that? Well, I think when I first came back to Sedalia, you know, I didn't, of course I live in Columbia now, but when I first came back, from, from college and started with Assured Partners. I, I mean, I, I lived in Sedalia the first, first five years, so I only recently moved to Columbia. And so when I came back, I was, I was asked or I, I sought out opportunities to get involved. And I would say by the time I was a year in to my, my role here at Assured Partners, maybe a year and a half in, I think I counted it up. It may have been two years, but I was on like six, six or seven boards or associated with, with that amount of it. And, and so I was really just trying to see what I liked. You know, I was trying to, you know, not only be influential and helpful in whatever organization I was a part of, but I didn't know what would resonate with me, you know? So I can't, when I came back today, I just got as involved as I could met as many people. I realized that even though it was a very small town, you know, I, I didn't know everybody. And so getting to your point about business development, I, I did want to meet more people just in general, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't know what I, what would resonate with me. So I was on the chamber of commerce board. I was on the public works board, the board for the developmentally disabled, a whole host of economic development. I was never on their board, but I was always involved. And so, you know, 
And now I find myself on less boards, but I'm, I'm just committing more of my time to some of the boards that one have decided to keep me on, you know, <laughs> and, and two, that I, I felt a real drive to, uh, you know, stay on and be a contributor. I think that's a great approach. Try out at a lot of different things, find the ones that you are most interested in and maybe where you can help them the most and then focus your time there. I think that's a great approach. I guess you're getting ready to go on the honeymoon board here pretty quickly. Hmm. Uh, and that's surely going to take up a little bit of your time. You know, I know you just from talking to you and being around you, I know you stay up with what's happening, um, you know, in the, in the, in the marketplace and in, in business, in the world, what's happening, uh, from your perspective, what do you see happening right now that you think is just really cool? It really excites you. So if I said legislation, you'd probably fall asleep in your, in your chair, but I might, you might, well, in fact, don't It'd make for a very long podcast, but, uh, wake up cliff. No, I, I, I think there's a lot of things to be excited about, but in my industry specifically, I'd say if I had to drill down to the one thing that's on my mind right now, it would be the, you know, uh, the secure act that passed in 2019 at the end of 2019 that allowed for what we call PEPs or plural employer plans in the retirement space, you know, due to the legislation that was passed by that act, we're seeing the development and deployment of, of these plans that are driving the small and middle market 401k and other defined contribution plans to a solution that, that allows them to aggregate with other employers on one plan document to increase, you know, their buying power, lower investment fees, and almost entirely dispose of audit costs if they're, if they're an audit level, audit level employer. And so, with all of that, they're also able to offload some fiduciary liability to another entity altogether. So in the retirement plan space, we've been placing a lot of our clients in these PEPs just because it's it's been due to legislation. It's been something that's become available that we can act on and, and, and help our clients. So it's kind of funny because when we think of legislation, a lot of times it's always its purpose is always to be for the betterment of whatever it is, of course, but it doesn't always work out that way. I'll, I'll keep my uh, mouth shut on what I think what was uh, positive and negative in terms of legislation, but this was certainly something positive in my industry that uh, has allowed us to help our clients. Yeah, well, and that's, I mean, that's why you're there, right? There's uh, all different kinds of legislation, but positive legislation that can bring value to a, a customer base is, is solid. I really have enjoyed visiting with you. I, I think you've had a lot of great things to say. You know, I really liked your perspective on opportunity in rural America as a way to attract young people back. We've got to get more young people that want to live out here, that want to build a career, that want to build a life. And uh, you and I both know what a great lifestyle we can enjoy out here, low cost of living, got a little country setting, maybe a little bit more laid back. But, you know, from a sales standpoint, um, you know, maybe the best thing you said was, listening and answering, asking good questions. You know, when you're, when you're selling and when you're marketing, you really have to be able to do that to be able to determine what it is that your customer needs and whether or not you have what it takes to meet that need. And so I, I think you just had a lot of great things to say. You know, the one thing that you, you put into your, uh, your comments, and I made a note of it because I wanted to bring it up, is the word grit. And I love the word grit grit. And it truly is a rural American word, um, at least the way it is from my perspective. But, you know, grit is toughness, it's perseverance, it's uh, doing what it takes to get the job done, doing it right. And I think those are all the elements of what people of rural America are all about. So thank you for being with me today. Thanks for sharing your insight and your passion for who you are and what you do. I appreciate it. Cliff, I appreciate you having me on and, and uh, hope we, we can catch up again after this sometime soon. We're going to catch up at your uh, wedding reception. Oh, is that an a informal RSVP? It's an informal RSVP, but I think it's going to be formal pretty quick. Do you want the uh, beef or salmon, Cliff? I'm going to mark you down. <laughs> I'm going to mark you down right now. I doubt that you're in charge of keeping track of the salmon and the beef, but maybe you, you are. are. You are 100%, 1,000% right. I am not in charge of that. <laughs> I have enjoyed our visit today. Thank you, Cliff. Hey, thanks for listening to OutDrive, folks. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. Hope you've enjoyed our visit today with 
Brendan Hurley with Assured Partners. Come back again next week, and I'll take you down the roads of rural America where it's heaven on earth. Thanks for taking a ride with us on OutDrive. This episode is complete, so head on over to eCallus.com for show notes and more insight you can apply to help drive your business growth. And be sure to sign up for our free monthly e-letter, OutThink, for even more helpful content about marketing to rural America. Have a great day and keep on driving.